Hey, it's Ken here, and I wanted to uh, bring uh, an expert series, a video series and a podcast. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm interviewing some amazing professionals that I work with in uh, my day-to-day -day business in real estate. And these experts um, help you, the clients, uh, make an informed decision um, about purchasing and selling uh, your home. So uh, on today's episode, I talked to Jason Cherry of Cherry Home Inspections, and we talk about the generalities of a home inspection, what to look for, uh, some potential issues, and all of the things that are covered in a home inspection. I really hope you enjoy this, uh, this interview, and uh, stay tuned for many more. All right, so I'm here with Jason Cherry of uh, Cherry Home Inspections, and um, we're going to be doing a lot of work together at uh, in 2019. And so I wanted to get Jason on a call because I know a lot of people like to uh, kind of do some research before they they choose a home inspector. And uh, Jason has uh, quite a bit of experience, inspected thousands of properties and homes. Uh, over the, the course of his career and we'll let Jason explain all that but um, I wanted this interview to be a great resource for anybody thinking about making a purchase and really even if you're thinking about selling and want to get a, a pre-inspection done um, Jason's going to be your guy uh, to do that so let's jump right into it uh, how you doing Jason I'm great how are you today I'm well I'm well how's 2019 treating you it's starting to ramp up. It's uh, it's really good. Back to business. Christmas was a nice time to rest and relax, and now we're back into it. Back into it. So uh, let's let's start off with uh, just give us a minute or so of your background, your your history with inspections. Yeah, I um, so I've always done construction of some sort. Just all various things, different houses of mine and friends and whatnot. I also, uh, I went to school for architecture. I went to Fanshawe in London for architectural technology. Uh, basically used the building code as a pillow for four years. And then out of there, I started working for, um, for an insurance company inspecting uh, houses and evaluating for replacement costs, which thankfully I don't do anymore because that was always a hard thing to manage. But um, Sure. Uh, yeah, so inspecting thousands of houses from uh, Montreal to Vancouver. Wow. Uh, and I, uh, I moved out west for a little while, uh, running around the mountains, and then moved back to Ontario. Did it for another nine years. And last year, after uh, my wife and some friends had been uh, yelling at me to start my own inspection company, I finally followed their good advice and uh, pulled the plug on that and uh, started Cherry Home Inspections early last year. Nice, nice. And so... Um, what have you noticed any differences from your previous inspection uh, services to this you know doing your own business well the biggest thing is now I'm actually having to run a business while working in the business so I right. always say I'm uh, my best employee but not always the best boss because it's uh, it's just an interesting thing um, to move from you know running around going wherever somebody needs you to now finding the people and telling them you need you. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, it changes the focus. Biggest growing pain. I'm sure it's a typical of uh, virtually everybody who starts a, a business in something they're already familiar with. Right, right. So uh, let's, let's dive right into if, uh, if a buyer, a home, a, per, uh, a home buyer is looking to, to seek you out, find a home inspector, and they want to... Um, uh, they have some questions in regards to why you, uh, you kind of answered a little bit of that with your experience. What do you bring to the table as a home inspector? Um, forget the experience part. We've already talked about that, but, um, you know, what kind of, what kind of, uh, services and things do you offer? Um, maybe give us a breakdown of, of, you know, a typical home inspection, uh, in, in terms of a subdivision, there's condos and there's there's uh, vacation properties. There's a bunch of different properties, but you know, in terms of what the general population is probably going to be purchasing in 2019, what's what's a typical home inspection going to entail? Um, so the practical side of it, um, I uh, always show up early. Uh, I'm uh, pretty neurotic about uh, being early, so I can get prepared. So you're not standing around while I'm pulling ladders down and whatnot. Um, at every step, I'm involving the, the homeowner and the, the realtor. Um, you know, we're all kind of a team uh, working to a common goal. So um, I, 
I'm always reminding them to ask questions. It doesn't matter how simple or, um, you know, if they think it's a stupid question, there's no such thing. Uh, every question deserves an answer. So uh, I invite people to either let me do my thing or they can follow me around and breathe down my neck. It's, a, it's an opportunity for an education. Um, I've benefited from many people over the years sharing their, their knowledge with me and I love to uh, uh, share that forward and the better educated they are on the process the better they better equipped they are to actually use the report that I create for them um, to the, the to the intended uh, purpose so sure. they can uh, make their decisions uh, as well informed as possible um, it, as I say it's, it's an opportunity for educating everybody uh, just so we're all working to that common goal yeah and so when you uh, maybe we'll walk through just the main points of the home inspection uh just so that a buyer who hasn't purchased before or maybe they haven't uh they, they're selling their house and they're making a purchase it's been 30 years um let's start at the top when you when you hop on a roof what what things or what signs are you looking for to uh make sure a roof is in good condition or some things that may cause a red flag Sure. Uh, so first of all, uh, if, if it's just a typical shingle roof, I'm looking to see if uh, the edges around each shingle uh, is sharp. Uh, um, if it looks like it's fairly new, as shingles age, they lose their their uh, their granular aggregate, the, the, the sand essentially that's on it. Sure. Um, the edges get a little bit softer and, and a little bit worn. Uh, so I'm looking for that. Also, I look in the eaves trough if there's a whole bunch of granular there or debris from the uh, from the, the shingles that gives an indication of just general expected wear and tear. I'm looking for fasteners that um, that are going through the shingles from exterior to interior. Uh, so if um, if the roofers put a, a nail through uh, in a place that couldn't be covered by a shingle and they didn't put uh, a little bit of roofing tar on it, that's a potential for a corroded nail that'll allow water to, to make its way into the attic. Um, often, uh, Technicians who install satellite dishes or other roof mounted things, um, you know, there's varying degrees of skill and knowledge in, in that realm. So sure. while most of the time they're installed well, but I'm paying close attention to anything that's installed on the roof. Um, flashing uh, at valleys or where the roof meets a sidewall, skylights, just anywhere uh, uh, that there's a protrusion through the roof, roof vents, uh, um, plumbing vents. Uh, so I'm uh, flashing all the way around. I'm looking at anything that is either worn out a little bit or not really installed properly in the first place. Uh, it, ultimately, the exterior portion of the uh, home inspection, uh, the majority of it I'm looking for opportunity for water to get in, uh, secondarily opportunity for pests to get in, and then you know structural elements. But on the roof, it's, it's largely water. And I would think that that sort of carries into the windows to a degree. You want to make sure that, you know, the caulking is, is uh, not corroding or, 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 you know, fading, falling apart. Right. Um, and the windows can obviously be uh, very old. Uh, so they may need to be, you know, replaced or brought up to today's standards uh, if there's drafts or whatever. But I, it would go along with, with the roof in terms of air or water potentially getting in there. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about uh, probably one of the, one of the larger, um, uh, let's stay on the outside. In terms of if they have, if they have a brick facade, um, mm -hmm. what are some, some, some potential issues that you could see um, that may need to either be corrected or may be a huge deal? So um, the biggest thing with brick is cracking. Um, if there is cracking in the mortar or the bricks themselves, uh, we, we need to, um, it's not the primary Sorry, the primary thing I'm looking at with brick isn't the crack itself, it's what's causing the crack. So right. typically it's something below. Uh, so if I see a significant amount of cracking in the brick, uh, I'm looking at the foundation. Um, and if there's a crack in the foundation below, um, then something has caused it to move. Either something is pushing up or something is allowing it to settle down. Um, right. So soil erosion or whatnot. And at that point, we really want to get an engineer or a foundation repair company. Um, I'm a generalist, not an expert. I'm great at finding the issues and simple things I can give a, an explanation of. Larger things, that's when we uh, pull in the experts. Um, so assuming it's not something that is a structural issue when, or we've repaired the structural issue, then the cracks are a matter of um, 
they allow more water and brick is porous water can soak in uh, we try to keep it from happening but the cracks that's that's a pathway for water when water gets in and then it freezes in uh, weather like today it'll expand cause more damage so uh, once the cause of the crack is, is solved, then we go to repointing or just caulking larger cracks, whatever is necessary by a, or whatever is deemed necessary by a mason, and keep the water out at that point. Right, right. Um, that that takes me to the next uh, point. You sort of touched on it with foundations. Um, what are, in in your opinion, what are some some causes of foundation cracks? I'll, I ask that for a couple of reasons because sometimes there are major issues and sometimes you see a hairline crack that you may want to get, uh, you know, filled by a, a foundation specialist who comes in and does epoxies and things like that. But what are you, what are you normally seeing in, in a, you know, let's say a 30 to 30 year old to new built house, kind of a standard subdivision. Um, what are you seeing in terms of foundation issues? So, Virtually all concrete will crack somewhere, um, and that's that's just the nature of concrete. That's why on a, on a floor slab or a patio slab, for example, you see control cuts. That's telling the concrete where we want it to crack for cosmetic issues or, or otherwise. Um, in a foundation wall, again, you're going to get cracking somewhere, very likely. Hairline cracks, worst case scenario there typically is it's a path for water. So yeah, like you say, we want to get those uh, fixed up and they're fairly inexpensive um, to fix from, by the foundation repair companies. If there's waterproofing on the outside, it'll minimize the chance of water uh, migration. But again, you want an expert to look at it. If right. it's a larger crack, uh, something that's widened, then there's clearly some movement going on and, and it's the movement that has caused the crack and will continue to exacerbate the situation. That'll allow more water in. It can also uh, compromise the, the structure uh, above. So that's, that's where we see some brick cracking. So when I see larger cracks, um, something that's, you know, something you could stick a pencil into or, you know, not quite that big, but that, that's when it's uh, certainly something that needs to be looked at by, by a, an expert. Sure, sure. So, okay, so um, we've sort of addressed all the main major components uh, structurally of a house. You know, obviously, if uh, if drywall uh, and ceiling or walls, if there's cracking there, there's going to be some settling and movement within the structure of the house. Uh, that kind of goes back to either poor framing, potentially, or uh, foundation issues or, or um, you know, footing issues. Um, that's crack some, drywall can also be caused, by, sorry to interrupt, crack drywall uh, and, and the like can also be caused simply by fluctuation in temperatures, uh, lower humidity or higher humidity, um, all those things can cause things to swell, expand, contract, and you can get some some cracking that is just typical of, of those And you see that in, yeah, and you see that in trim work uh, a lot too, especially if there's crown molding and it's on an outside wall and it's feeling that coolness and 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 uh, and warmth in the summer. I wanted to talk about that. It's a great point. Y you have a, a tool that measures or can potentially look at uh, heat loss, mm -hmm. um, and mainly it's used for you know spots where insulation is missing or uh, you know um, things like that. Talk a little bit about that and how that can benefit the uh, the, uh, the potential buyer. Yeah, I'm looking for my infrared camera right now. Sorry about this. <laughs> it's in my uh, bag of tricks. Um, yeah, infra my infrared camera. Um, sorry, I guess this is an edit point. I should have had it out. That's okay. Uh, oh, where did I put that damn thing? And as he's looking, so... I, I, I think it's in my car. I can, uh, we can just talk. I don't need to... Yeah, I know. That's okay. Yeah, so uh, I'll start over. Um, so yeah, I've got an infrared camera. Um, what that does is it shows me heat patterns on surfaces. So uh, if there's an area of a wall that is colder or warmer, I'll be able to see that. The, an infrared camera sees in heat, not visible light. So if I see a, a pattern that uh, sometimes it's obvious what it is, whether it's 
uh, air infiltration, I see wispy lines. Uh, if it's uh, water damage, I might see blotches. If it's uh, missing insulation, I might actually see the shape of the bat insulation that has moved or is missing. Um, and electrical hot spots, which aren't very common, but uh, obviously that would just create some heat inside of a wall. So if it's something that looks like it might be moisture related, um, the infrared camera doesn't tell me anything for certain. It gives me an indication that I can then make an estimate as to what's going on. From then I can go to my moisture meters. I have two different kinds of moisture meters. One is a, uh, it's got two little pins. It's a standard moisture meter. I can poke it into material like framing and whatnot. And it measures the actual amount of moisture in that, uh, in that area. So right. that'll confirm that there is a moisture level of whatever percentage that might be too high or maybe it's okay. You know, around six or 10%, that's normal. If we get into 30, 40% or above, then potentially there's an issue. Um, I also have a pinless moisture meter, which is great for uh, drywall surfaces or any finished surface where the homeowner would be very upset if I'm poking uh, two little holes inside of all the drywall all over the place. Not the best uh, impression to make. So uh, mm -hmm. I have a few different devices that'll give me an indication as to whether moisture uh, uh, is or is not present. Of course, the best thing to do is to get my eyes on it. So if it's on a ceiling, um, uh, I will absolutely be into the attic eventually, and I'll have a look at that area, put my eyes right on it, and see what I can sure. find there. But sure. short of that, uh, the devices are, are a big help to, uh, to elucidate some of those issues. Sure. So um, a couple of the other things I guess we can kind of, we can, we can touch on um, are, is the plumbing and, and mechanical systems, uh, and then we'll talk about the electrical. But um, what are, what are just some main issues you probably will run into uh, in a typical inspection uh, for plumbing? What, what, do you, what do you sort of normally find? So I like to consider the age of the house first of all, and that will indicate um, what sort of materials I expect to find. So a brand new house, it's going to be all ABS uh, drain pipe, it's gonna be maybe copper, most of it is PEX now, just the, the plastic pipe. Um, and that's, uh, that's all good and assuming it's installed properly and inspected by an inspector, it should be good. Of course, I'm still gonna, uh, going to look at everything. Um, in that case, I'm looking at DIY. Uh, I, I, you know, not all DIY is bad. Some of it's great, some of it's not so great, and that's what I'm looking for. Uh, at that point, I'm looking for poor connections of supply lines. I'm looking for missing vents under, uh, sorry, mi missing vent traps, P-traps under the, uh, sinks, uh, poor venting. If there's not uh, adequate venting supplied to the trap, the drain might not um, work properly. It may allow uh, uh, gases, uh, sewer gases to come up through the sink. So those are some of the things I'm looking for in conventional plumbing. Uh, if we get a little older, I'm looking for galvanized steel plumbing. It's, it's a silver pipe with threaded fittings. That stuff we stopped using probably over 50 years ago for plumbing supply, and it's okay. got a shelf of 40 to 50 years. So any galvanized plumbing that's out there is older than its expected lifespan and should be replaced. And that's something right. your insurance company is, is going to uh, really insist on anyway. So it's good to get that out. I'm also looking for, um, uh, there's two types of piping that were used that have, uh, that were recalled. Uh, the most recent one is Kitec. It it's, uses some PEX, but it's got a layer of aluminum in the piping as well. Uh, we can go into that later if you want or in another video. But basically, Kitec was recalled because it has a higher than average failure rating. So if it's right. in the house, I make a note and I want a plumber to look at it and assess it, and probably they'll talk about the best way to replace it. The older one was polybutylene. Uh, we call it PB piping. It was a gray pipe, and you don't see it very often, but I did see it the other day in a, in a, a retrofit of an area of a, of a century home. And that had a similar issues to Kitec. It just has a high failure rate. There are different things that influence. Uh, the cause of the failure, but ultimately it was unstable enough uh, to warrant a, um, a class action lawsuit and a, and a recall. So when I see those, those are definitely issues, both from a, a you know keeping your house dry standpoint so it doesn't fail, but also uh, your insurance uh, company is going to want to see that gone anyway. Um, when I see stain, uh, sorry, um, uh, cast iron piping. It's not necessarily an issue. Cast iron was used for drain piping before we started using ABS. A brief period there we had brass drains, but that's a, a different story. So uh, cast iron, 
Um, the large diameter piping is usually fairly good, especially if it's just the vent stack. It, if it stays relatively dry or if it dries fairly quickly because it's in a vertical orientation, it can last a really long time. The horizontal pipes, they hold water a little more, so they'll corrode a lot uh, more readily. Uh, thinner diameter pipes, um, you don't see those a lot anymore because the corrosion would actually narrow the drain uh, sufficiently that it just wouldn't work properly. Whenever I see those, if I don't see any obvious issues, I'll still recommend that a plumber inspect, maybe snake the pipe out, um, uh, or scope the pipe with a, with a camera, and uh, just have a look on the inside to make sure it's in good shape because there can be uh, issues going on inside the pipe that aren't fully apparent. As well, if the uh, sewer line hasn't been replaced on the way out of the house, anywhere you see cast iron pipe, where it enters the ground, it will be a clay pipe because the cast iron would have corroded pretty quickly away if you buried it. So it's a clay pipe, which over the years, it can crack and uh, the joints can, can crack from settling. Uh, those are the pipes that tree roots absolutely love. So they'll get inside, they'll start with the spider roots uh, that will start clogging it up. You can, you can clear it out, um, but eventually the roots will get thicker and thicker and they'll break the pipe up and potentially cause a complete clog of the pipe or a failure, and then you get a, a backup in your home. So right. you always want a plumber to look at that. And there's various options for either fixing, repairing. Um, uh, like I said, there's various things you can do to deal with that. Lots of options. Okay, great. And so um, <clears throat> the the other major, uh, not major, but potential uh, cost, major cost for a buyer would be furnace replacement. And um, so when you're looking at a furnace in the HVAC system, what, what things either raise red flags or what are you looking at to, uh, you know, make, make the buyer feel comfortable that it's a, it's a good working furnace? Um, from the home inspection side, um, we don't we don't open the furnace up too much. I open the access panels. I want to see how clean it is. Uh, any electronics that are dirty uh, will heat up too much, just like your computer. You keep your computer cleaned out uh, so it doesn't get too hot and damage the circuitry. Same thing with a furnace. There's an awful lot of electronics inside uh, modern furnaces, so you want to keep the dust off of all of that. I'm also looking uh, to see that the firing cycle is appropriate. So what I like to do is I open it up, I'll run up, kick the, the thermostat up a few degrees, and then I run back down and I wanna see how it fires up, um, uh, just to make sure that it, it, it does it normally. Once it's burning, I wanna look at the flames. Um, a, a gas furnace, the flames should largely be very stable, not flickering too much. They should be a nice blue color. There will be a little bit of flickering, maybe a little yellow or orange flame on occasion, but if I see a lot of that, it can indicate a few different things. Um, it can indicate that maybe not enough makeup air is getting in, not enough combustion air, sorry, is getting in to, to burn it properly. Uh, it may indicate that there's a, a crack in the heat exchanger. Um, it may indicate that the burners are dirty. So um, I am not the furnace expert. I am, a, like I say, I'm a generalist, so I'll look for symptoms and then I can give my two cents and then refer to an HVAC professional who is uh, able to make the exact diagnosis and offer uh, whatever repairs or replacement. Makes sense, makes sense. The, the last thing I wanna talk about uh, in this conversation is the electrical. There's lots to talk about obviously uh, in the home, things like gas fireplaces, um, Various things, but uh, but for today and for time, um, let's 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 move to the electrical. What sort of things do you find typically uh, in a house that can cause you know red flags for uh, the electrical component of, of the home inspection of the house? So, just like with the plumbing, uh, fairly new houses don't have a whole lot of issues in that regard, uh, especially with electrical because building inspectors don't even inspect the electrical, it's the ESA, the Electrical Safety Authority. So all of the electrical inspection are, uh, inspections are done by that authority and every inspector, uh, as far as I know, is an electrician. Um, and then they, um, they end up in the role of, of inspecting and it, it works out really well. So uh, modern wiring, newer stuff that has been inspected by them, I rarely find any issues. Uh, I'll still have a look, of course, um, but rarely do I find issues. Again, just like with plumbing, it's the DIY stuff because there's a lot of uh, nuance and intricacy to 
um, to wiring that um, isn't apparent when, you know, for somebody who knows how to wire an outlet, they don't necessarily know that you can't have more than 12 devices on a circuit. They may not know that within six feet of a sink, you have to have a GFCI outlet, different things like that. They, uh, a lot of people don't know that most of your outlets now should be protected or are supposed to be protected by an arc fault uh, circuit break or arc fault interrupter circuit break. Yeah. Um, so things like that that you don't see in the DIY realm. Uh, when we get into older things, um, um, we're looking at, <coughs> excuse me, we're looking at uh, grounding for one. Um, uh, the original wiring was knob and tube. Uh, I had a video recently that explains a little bit of that, um, which we can link to perhaps. But sure. um, uh, so the original knob and tube, the biggest problem with it, it wasn't grounded. Um, there are ways to achieve grounding in retrofit situations, but you also want to look at with knob and tube if it's overloaded. Um, we didn't used to have as many devices on our electrical system that we do now. So with only a few circuits, but we have all of the modern electrical uh, load on it, it can, you can potentially overload circuits. Um, the, the sheathing on the, the wires can dry and crack out over the decades since it's been installed, sometimes a century. So um, it's more susceptible to water and the, the wiring just wasn't built to the same um, degree as uh, wiring is today. So it can't handle as high of uh, heat loads that, that can happen in electrical situations. So um, when we see that or aluminum wiring, which has its own raft of issues, which we won't, we don't need to get into here, but uh, I always say if there's aluminum in the house, whether it's been tampered with or not, an electrician has to look at it because it doesn't age well. Um, so those are the things I'm looking at. So the age of the house, if it's from the you know 60s, 70s, I'm looking for aluminum. If it's before that, I'm looking for knob and tube. And at all ages of houses, I'm looking for DIY issues. Right, right. And I guess some a couple of things that can potentially cause some issues that it might even be hard for you as the inspector to see would be junction boxes buried you know, in walls or ceilings. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and then, then other things like the panel, uh, it, it could have been manipulated by the homeowner or, or potentially a DIY electrician guy in terms of double tapping circuits, which could cause overloading. Um, and then the other thing as an agent going through uh, and, and with my rental background that I found is a lot of homes in subdivisions and in older homes, they don't necessarily have bedroom lights. You walk in and flick the switch and it's actually for a plug because they used to not have to, to put a, a center light in a bedroom. So uh, not, that that, not that it's an issue, but in today's lifestyle where we want to get in, turn the light on, get dressed, go to bed, get up, get out, it's, it can cause you know, uh, some headache. Uh, all things that can be obviously fixed and remedied, but um, uh, it's, it's interesting to see the evolution of, of the electrical part you know, of, of homes where they've sort of come from and where we're at today. Yeah, um, when we see things like that, people will often ask me how to make it better and how to fix it. So, because I've got an extensive reno background, um, I always give the caveat that I am not an electrician, but we can talk about the easier ways to add in extra lighting. Um, right. You know, if there's room in the panel, for example, to add extra circuits. So, uh, going back to the panel, I, I do open up the panel. There's been uh, lots of back and forth between uh, the ESA, um, uh, uh, WSIB, the home inspection associations on whether home inspectors should be allowed to open up panels. At this point, the going consensus is that we are allowed to open up panels, but of course we don't jam anything in there, which uh, would be a, a foolish thing to do anyway. So uh, yeah, we're looking for double taps and things like that. But um, just looking at the panel can, can let you know if there is potential for expanding the electrical system because on an older house, um, you know, people want, like you say, those extra uh, elements in, in lighting and, and other service things. So at that point we could recommend uh, an electrician could Maybe you just make, uh, put in a newer panel, put in a new panel, something like that. Sure. Uh, my last question uh, before we have to go here. Um, a lot of homes today, a lot of, sorry, a lot of buyers today are looking for ready to move in homes, meaning they're looking at uh, a home that's had some work done. They don't want to do the work. They would rather just move into the home and it be ready to go. There's obviously some buyers out there that would like to do some work themselves, but um, when you're looking at a home that's been, you know, flipped or uh, extensive work done, 
and you don't really have the records, you know, who's done the work, where their permits pulled, all those sorts of things. Um, is there anything you kind of look for or, or are checking? And I know we've talked about a lot of it already, but, um, you know, for the potential buyer that wants to purchase this home, what sort of things are you trying to, you know, look for? So um, the, a circuit tester is my best friend. It's just a three prong device. You can get them for $20 and um, the, you know, there are lots of different uh, types of electrical testing devices, but I, on my hip, I always have my circuit tester to start with and I plug it into every outlet that I find. Um, if the polarity is reversed as in the black and white wires are connected uh, on the opposite sides, uh, oftentimes that's not a huge issue. It could also be a major uh, potential for electrocuting you. Um, so, um, things like that I look for if, if um, any, any evidence that it was installed in a more amateurish way, things aren't level, um, th those are the things I'm looking for. And ultimately, I can't open up walls. I can't look at what's inside short of, um, you know, swinging around my infrared camera. So um, I just, I'm extra diligent with everything I'm looking at and I take extra notes and I just have candid conversations with the homeowner that uh, it looks like this uh, potentially wasn't done with a permit, it potentially wasn't done by a professional, and you know they, they are then informed and they can go back to the buyer and ask for that documentation, or ask for, uh, you know maybe go ahead and have the house inspected by ESA, or a licensed plumber, or an HVAC technician, just to do their due diligence and make sure that everything is, is installed properly, regardless of whether there was a permit or not. The simple fact is so many houses are are renovated without permits and especially at certain price points and it's just a simple fact that you know there are going to be a lot of houses that, that change hands that haven't had permits so even if the permit isn't there not saying that it's okay to not get a permit but it's there and you know you just have right. to buy some as they are so we just do our due diligence and look at everything as closely as we can right awesome um you can be found on uh, Instagram at uh, Cherry Home Inspections. Cherry Home Inspections on Instagram, LinkedIn. I have a Facebook page, um, my website, cherryhomeinspections.ca. And I'll link everything uh, in the description um, below. Uh, you can also find uh, Jason um, on my website under professionals as well. And um, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me.